Hello and welcome to the special episode of the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Before we get started with this episode, I just had to include a quick note. So in the midst of recording this, we actually had some technical difficulties, which is one of those things that all podcasters can tell you happens from time to time, and we lost some audio. So I wanted to do a special thanks to Eric and Matt for graciously volunteering to help to recover what was lost, to recreate some of the audio. They went above and beyond, and I cannot thank them enough for their partnership in this episode. Of course, if we were going to have an episode that we were going to have difficulty, those of you who have listened to the podcast for a while know that, of course, it would happen with Timothy Pickering. But I digress. Any audio issues I take full responsibility for, and I see this episode as yet another shining example of just the great community of podcasters that's out there and that I've been very blessed to be a part of. So thanks to Matt and Eric, and thank you to all of you for listening. My apologies again for any audio issues, but I think that you will enjoy our conversation and hopefully learn a bit more about the second Secretary of War and the third Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering. Without further ado, let us begin. This is one of the episodes of our special series, A Seat at the Table, where we take a look at a cabinet member in each episode. Some cabinet members are more well-known, others not so much. Regardless, we look at their life and career and then discuss their legacy. And with these special episodes, I'm inviting on fellow podcasters to be able to discuss these cabinet members, again, that they may or may not have heard of. And so for this episode, I'm joined by Eric and Matt of the Ranking 76 podcast. Eric and Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Jerry. Thank you for having us. This will be fun. So glad to have you here. And um, with their podcast, they are actually new to the podcasting game. And so you may not have heard of their podcast yet, but believe me, you need to check it out. And I will let them tell us a little more about what they're doing in podcasting. Uh, Yeah, so we are actually very new. We actually just started dropping episodes in November. So what we are attempting to do is rank 76 different Wild West figures in American history and do it kind of on a morality scale uh, if we think they're a good guy, a bad guy, uh, using that Rex Factor formula that we all love. And then we're actually drafting them to our teams, and that's how we will actually make our tournament. Absolutely. And I, I remember those early podcasting days, trying to to find your way it's always interesting and i love the take that you're you're doing with this really excited to see where you go on your episodes and on your journey and with the the growing rexy pod family it's always interesting to see what new concepts folks come up with to take that model and run with it so check out their podcast after you get done with this one but we are going to throw ourselves into examining a new cabinet member. And as usual, I did not share who the cabinet member that we were going to be discussing was beforehand. So Eric and Matt are just learning now that we will be discussing Timothy Pickering. Oh, well, no, I <laughs> heard the name and I think I can probably guess the president, but that's it. Never heard of him. He is a character if you if you know the later part of the the Washington presidency and the Adams presidency you've probably heard of Timothy Pickering but folks generally don't know too many details about his life so to get us started with that Timothy Pickering was born in Salem Massachusetts on July 17th 1745 he was the son of Timothy and Mary Winget Pickering and so As usual with names around that time, the fathers would often name the sons after themselves. Mothers would name their daughters after themselves. But our Pickering was one of nine children. And though he wouldn't rise nearly as high as Timothy, Pickering's brother John also got involved in politics, and he would later serve as the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Now, a minister in Salem said of our Timothy that, quote, from his youth, his townsmen proclaim him assuming, turbulent, and headstrong. So if that gives you any indication of what's ahead. <laughs> Politics for you. Yeah, I don't know how many figures were not <laughs> headstrong in this period. Those words will be used 
quite a bit in describing Timothy Pickering over the years. So he didn't grow out of that. But he attended grammar school. Then, like many leaders in Massachusetts at the time, he studied at Harvard College until his graduation in 1763. So after graduation, he returned to Salem and worked for John Higginson, who was the town clerk of Salem, as well as the registrar of deeds for Essex County. And like many men of the era, Timothy got involved in the local militia. And in 1766, he was commissioned as a lieutenant of the Essex County Militia. He rose to the rank of captain in 1769, which was the same year that he published an essay on drilling soldiers in the Essex Gazette. So, you know, here we've got a new captain who's already telling folks how to (laughs) actually do things. Yeah, I'm sure they love that. Well, from previous, from military, the military experience I have, that's exactly what they do. Get out of college and just think they know, you know, the exact everything that needs to happen. No, no experience whatsoever. But I'm going to tell you how to do your job, though. (laughs) Gotta love it. Gotta love it. And apparently that does not change over time. (laughs) Hmm. Kind of picking up some Alexander Hamilton vibes already with Headstrong. We shall see some Hamiltonian vibes with Pickering. So like most of the folks that we've discussed in the series to date, it's not surprising Pickering went into law and he was admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in 1768. Then only a few short years later, Pickering would actually assume his first public office when he succeeded John Higginson as the county registrar of deeds in 1774. Then shortly after, he was elected to the Massachusetts General Court, which was the Legislative Assembly of Massachusetts, and he was also chosen to be a justice on the Essex County Court of Common Pleas. And we've seen some other uh, folks in this series that have held multiple offices at the same time. It's not something that we're used to nowadays, but there was a limited amount of folks and offices that needed to be filled. So sometimes you you get these instances like this. But just as Pickering's public service career seemed to be taking off, increasingly the minds of the citizens of Massachusetts was turning to war. A little thing you may have heard of, the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Oh, maybe vaguely, vaguely, very vaguely. It, it, it gets a couple of mentions in American history. (laughs) So as it seemed that there would soon be armed conflict with British forces, Pickering's article for drilling soldiers from a few years back was actually dusted off and published in 1776 as quote, an easy plan for a militia. And this would actually be the drill book for the continental army until Baron von Steuben created his regulations on the order and discipline of the troops of the United States a few years later. So is he kind of the reason that the militia wasn't very well organized? From what you gather, the first couple of years, it wasn't much of an army back then. It was more of a gaggle. (laughs) That's a good question. (laughs) I I didn't actually go and and check it out, but yeah, it it did seem like until Baron von Steuben came around that (laughs) things weren't going so well. That may have been the easy plan for a militia. Just do whatever you think is best. (laughs) Yeah, just whatever. Just, you know, form form line. Do whatever you want. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the thing, though, right? None of these guys really had any training going in. So, I mean, I, I think they were just making it up as they go, weren't they? So, I mean, you, you pick up a guy uh, that has some leadership potential and just hope he can lead and train and whatever. Even this person who was captain for five seconds before starting to tell everybody what to do. Yeah, okay, well, he's a captain. We can trust him, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So Pickering would have a chance to put his ideas into action as his troops played a role in the battles of Lexington and Concord in April 1775, though they arrived late into the fighting and thus only played a minor role. But soon after, Pickering's force was absorbed into the New England Army that assembled to lay siege to British forces occupying Boston. And as the situation was growing ever more tense in Massachusetts, Pickering apparently did not just have military matters on the mind, because on April 8th, 1776, he married Rebecca Becky White. But he couldn't stay away from military matters for too long, though. I mean, there was quite a bit going on in 1776. So in December 1776, Pickering led a regiment of the Essex County Militia to New York. 
And a prominent witness to the progress of the militia under Pickering's command was none other than General George Washington, who promptly offered Pickering the position of Adjutant General of the Continental Army at the rank of Colonel. And basically, so the Adjutant General was the Chief Administrative Officer of a military force. And so again, you have this guy who's just kind of walking in. And, oh, well, his his force looks pretty good. So let's just go ahead and put him as the chief administrative officer of the entire army. So Pickering, of course, did accept this position. I mean, who wouldn't? And oversaw the construction of the Hudson River chain, which was a large chain that was put across the river to keep the Royal Navy from sending ships any further up the river past West Point. And this chain would be important in preserving West Point as a defensive position for the Continental Army for the rest of the war. So he is achieving some results, at least. And in August 1780, the Continental Congress chose Pickering to serve as quartermaster general, which is basically the person that's responsible for equipping the army. So he's gone from being like this administrative officer to now he's really about, you know, how is the army going to get the supplies that they need? And right. That's a significant job though. Like that's a really big deal for him to get that at a young age. Exactly. And he had some big shoes to fill because he actually assumed this role from Nathaniel Green. And this helped to free Green up so that he could take command of forces in the South. Because at that point, the Southern campaign was not going well. Continental Army had had major losses down there. And so Washington wanted to send Green, who he knew he could trust, to try and reverse the course down there. And of course, we know that he did. As described by Pickering's biographer, Gerald Clairfield, quote, In many ways, Pickering's wartime experience was disillusioning to him. At first, Pickering was filled with the provincial's pride in the moral superiority of the colonies over the mother country. He believed not only in the justice of the American cause, but also in the idea that out of the war would emerge a new, ethically superior civilization, an example for all mankind. With each passing month, Pickering learned more fully of the degeneracy of colonial society. Everywhere, it seemed were to be found those who were willing to corrupt or to be corrupted. Pickering emerged from the war a cynic, confirmed in his conservatism and convinced both of his own righteousness and of his belief that virtue was a commodity in short supply among his countrymen. So we hear so many stories of the Revolutionary War and this patriotic zeal, but one thing that Pickering offers us is kind of the reverse. Mm-hmm. You know. It, here you have somebody who starts out with that grandiose idea right. and reality just sinks in and turns him into a cynic. And we see so much of that in more modern accounts of war, especially like 20th century conflicts that are so decimating. And, and you hear more of that. But it's not generally something that we hear about with the Revolutionary War. Right. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Cause I mean, I, I did deploy too, and you, you, you do see things that you, you question, you know, and you always wonder like, is this doing, is this the right thing? Is, did, 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 did this happen correctly? Or so that's kind of interesting. I've never heard, actually heard of it in the revolutionary war, but it's just kind of um, interesting to see that like every war probably has that aha moment, I guess, where you're just like, huh, that's, that's what's going on, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. And and this is one thing and we'll see later on, this really does carry forward. This, this sticks with Pickering for the rest of his life. So the war is, is starting to wrap up. You know, we have Yorktown. And so as the war is wrapping up, Pickering actually lobbies to be appointed to the position of secretary at war, which had been occupied by Benjamin Lincoln until 1784, but we actually heard in an earlier episode on Henry Knox, Knox was the one who ultimately ended up with that position. But here, and and again, this is something that we don't hear as much about at this time, but we have Pickering that actively lobbied for a position. And there is this idea at the time that, you know, you don't want to seek a position you want to 
oh, you know, I guess if you're offering me this position, I'll take it. But here you have Pickering just saying, you know what? I want it. Right. Like he's just trying to submit his resume. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm here, right? <laughs> what I'm are you guys so, doing? I'm sorry. I just happened to drop my <laughs> resume in front of you. I hear that there's a position available. I don't know. Oh, what is this here? Is it? Oh, is this a training manual? This is really good. I wonder who wrote this. Oh, wait. Is it me? (laughs) Exactly. But he did not get that position. And in 1785, his position as quartermaster general was eliminated by Congress. And so not only did he not get the secretary position, he's now out of a job. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia... Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. So... You know, he has some options here and, you know, he could have gone back to Salem. That's where he was from. That's where his family was. But he actually settled in Philadelphia and he partnered with a colleague that he had met from the quartermaster's department, Samuel Hogston, to form a mercantile firm. Now, unlike with his military career, it appears that Pickering wasn't able to make things fall into place as a merchant because the firm didn't even make it to its second anniversary before it closed. And so, you know, here Pickering's kind of at a crossroads again. And so in 1786, like so many other young people of the time and in subsequent generations, Pickering turned his sights to the West as kind of the vehicle for securing that more prosperous future for him and his growing family. And he actually purchases around 10,000 acres of land on a bend of the Susquehanna River in what was then called the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. And again from Clearfield, quote, Pickering's move into the valley seems, in one sense at least, out of character. That a mind trained to frugality and caution should have undertaken a speculative venture is difficult to understand. But Pickering was an ambitious man hard-pressed by both economic and political misfortune. Evidently, he hoped in a new territory to become a leader and an aristocrat. And you see, like, you know, he, he arrives with his family in 1787, and he immediately does start rising in political prominence in the area. He serves as a registrar of deeds, judge of the orphans court, justice of the court of general quarter sessions, and a court recorder. So he's he's racking up those offices again. All right. So it's almost like uh, his ambition is really taken over. But are we sure he just doesn't? Uh, I don't know. Does he just talk a lot? Is what what's going on with this man? Exactly. You have to imagine that he has this. Oh, didn't you hear about my service and the revolution? I worked right. for this guy you may have heard of. You know, Washington. Yeah, yeah, we get it. Yeah, there's 10 positions here and there's seven people to fill up. Yes, you already have a job. Just <laughs> shut up already. You got it. Quit. Go on. Go on. Show up on Monday. <laughs> just shut up. And maybe that's how he ended up with some positions. It's like, okay, just just give it to him. Just give it to him. We're done. <laughs> now, the problem with this valley that he relocated his family in was that this land was also claimed by Connecticut. And settlers had moved into the same lands with deeds that were based on the claims of that state. So basically, at the same time that Pennsylvania was handing out deeds to folks, Connecticut was handing out deeds to the same land. And so you have these conflicting deeds. And there is so much turmoil Because, of course, you know, this is make or break for so many folks. You know, they've invested all their money into this land and now they show up and, oh, there's somebody else on my land and they're saying it's theirs. 
So there is this real chaos. And with Pickering in these offices, in these official offices, and in many respects, being kind of an on-the-ground representative of the Pennsylvania state government, he's really caught in the middle of this. And from Clearfield again, quote, Violence surged so close about his household that Pickering was once forced to flee to Philadelphia. On another occasion, he was kidnapped by a group of Connecticut claimants who hoped that they could thereby force his intercession in favor of the leader of their faction whom Pickering had helped arrest and who was jailed in Philadelphia. So he is actually captured by these folks from Connecticut and they actually hold him for three weeks until they finally, and and again, you have to imagine that he just started talking about this manual that he wrote and, oh, I was the quartermaster general. Okay, just shut up. Go, go. We don't want you anymore. <laughs> Right. Just kick him out the door. Just <laughs> lock him out. We don't want him anymore. This isn't worth it. <laughs> We're done. We we just, just shut up. We need some peace. <laughs> and the Pennsylvania state government did not help in quelling this turmoil. So Pickering found himself and his family caught in this challenging situation. But in 1787, he starts to have you know, there starts to get a ray of light because Pickering serves on the Pennsylvania State Convention, which ratifies this new document that came out of Philadelphia, the U.S. Constitution. And so they ratified it on December 12th. And so once the appropriate number of states ratify, we have a new government, we have a new executive branch, and there are all of these new positions that are available. And oh, by the way, that guy I knew back in the war, Washington, he's the president. Oh, how nice. And I think he knows me. I mean, me and George go way back. I know him. Have you seen my references? Number one is President Washington. So naturally, Pickering being Pickering, he attempts to secure a position in the new government. He lobbied to be named as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury There was actually somebody who had filled that position, but quickly left in the spring of 1790. Now, he was unsuccessful in this, but he did get named on two occasions as a representative of the U.S. government to negotiate with Native peoples in the Northwest. And both of these negotiations came out positive, at least from the vantage point of the Washington administration, the Native peoples, not so much, but that's unfortunately how... Things went back in those days, but he he did fulfill his missions in both of those. And at the end of the second mission, he was named to a new position in the federal government because after nearly two years as postmaster general, Samuel Osgood resigned from the post and Pickering was chosen as Osgood's replacement. And so now he finally has that full-time position in the new government. And Clairefield describes Pickering's tenure as Postmaster General as, quote-unquote, pleasant. And he asserts that he, quote, managed the Postal Department efficiently and economically. So he did a bit better than the post office is doing right now, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> but despite being named to this administrative role, and this may be part of the reason why it was pleasant, because Pickering would still be called upon to engage in diplomacy with Native people. So I guess once Pickering was out the door, things got a lot more pleasant around the post office. <laughs> <laughs> Probably quieter, but too. At the end of one of these missions in the autumn of 1793, Pickering would return to Philadelphia while it was in the grips of the infamous yellow fever epidemic of that year. Unfortunately, he would suffer a loss at home, as his six-year-old son, Edward, contracted the disease and died. Now, it was either because of the yellow fever they contracted that Edward died, or because of Dr. Benjamin Rush's treatment of bleeding. You know, back in those days, everything that happened, you know, you have a headache, okay, well, let's bleed you. I broke my leg, let's bleed you. Whatever it is. <laughs> I do not understand how they ever thought that was a good idea to bleed everyone essentially to death. They bleed for what I think he just liked it. 
The next year, in November 1794, Pickering successfully negotiated the Treaty of Canandaigua with the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois. This treaty defined the boundaries of Seneca lands in western New York. And so it was seen as a pivotal treaty at the time, and especially at this time, you know, Pickering was a part of that westward expansion. Unfortunately, the U.S. would not live up to most of the provisions of the treaty, as we see time and time and time again in American history with Native peoples. And so this is yet another instance. You know, I don't know that we can necessarily fault Pickering completely for this, but he did play a role in this. Do you get the sense that he was, that he believed he was dealing with native Americans fairly, or did he kind of understand that what he was doing wasn't up to par? There seems to be very different mindsets. I would think that he was more on the side of, I'm going to get what I'm going to get. I'm going to make this mission successful. I've got my, and, and, and this is one of the things that, that's so you know, I, I try to to be balanced and try and understand things from where folks are in the time period. And granted, right. you know, that was his job. You know, his job, he was given the task of go get as much as you can for the United States. But yeah, you know, it's frustrating. Even at this time, they were folks were already seeing the detrimental effects that these treaties and constantly being pushed off of land and they were seeing that the native peoples were suffering, but they wanted that land and they were willing right. to do whatever it took to get it. Right. And I just, I don't understand how they could even look in the moment that this was a good, this was going to look good in history. Generally, when you treat people like people in history, you're going to look favorably on more times than not. And it just seems like the only goal is to get more land and to at any way possible. And it's just, it's just disgusting. It really is a really sad part of our history. We can't get around. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I do try and put out the caveat and, and I've talked with numerous folks, numerous podcasters about this, you know, speaking as somebody in the, the historical present, I know that in the future, Folks are going to look back on us and criticize us for things. Well, why, why couldn't you fix that? You know, why were there people who were homeless? Why were there people who were hungry? You had the resources. And again, it's, you know, the, these issues are complicated and we do ultimately exist in a society that is unfair and inequitable. And, you know, we, the folks that are trying to change that, you know, just like we look at the past. And like you said, Eric, you know, folks that try and do the right thing, even if they don't get there, you know, they try and move the needle. Those are the folks who history looks on more favorably. And then there are the folks who just say, and like Pickering, you know, very much, well, this is just the way it is and don't really care. And those folks aren't generally viewed as favorably because it's like, why, why did you do that? So, and, and we'll, we'll have some more things to discuss with Pickering in that regard. So he's still, you know, acting in this role as um, a diplomat to native peoples. He's still the postmaster general, but in late 1794, President Washington started scrambling to find a replacement for Secretary of War Henry Knox. And for those who have listened to that episode, you know, there was a falling out there and Knox had been in the position for a long time. So he finally resigned. But this time in Washington's presidency was difficult whenever a vacancy came up in the cabinet because things were so politicized. You know, the factions were growing and folks just didn't want to be involved in politics, at least in in the cabinet. And so he was rebuffed by a few folks. Uh, And and here you have and, and just imagine George Washington is asking you to do something and you have numerous folks who are saying no to George Washington. Mm hmm. Blasphemy. And so you, 
you have some notable names, Charles Coatesworth Pinckney, Edward Carrington. They're like, no, I, I don't want to do this. And so finally, Washington's looking through his list of names. Oh, that's right. Pickering's still around. Maybe he can do it. And so Pickering is asked and accepts. And so he joins the administration as the second secretary of war on January 2nd. Do you think he was like raising his hand like a little kid trying to get his name called? Like, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me, like me. I'm right here, right here. Just throwing, out, throwing little rocks, pebbles at his window. Ting, 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 ting. You made a decision yet? Pick her <laughs> Yeah, just by his bedside while he sleeps. Pick her, pick her <laughs> Whatever he did, it worked because he joined the administration as the second secretary of war on January 2nd, 1795. And so, you know, we look at Pickering's resume to date and, you know, he, he really does. It does seem like this is a good fit for him. You know, he was the chief administrative officer of the army. He was the quartermaster general. He's had experience with the army. And at the time, you know, this is a much smaller army than he was dealing with with the Continental Army. There was this intense fear about having a large professional army for fear that it may be used against the people and it may lead to monarchy and aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And so folks didn't want that. So let's keep the size of the army small. So. Pickering wasn't just involved with the army, though, because like with his other fellow cabinet members, he was often asked to weigh in on the political issues and the foreign policy issues that the administration was facing. And the largest of those at that point was the Jay Treaty. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but basically the Jay Treaty, um, John Jay, who was the chief justice of the Supreme Court, was sent to London to negotiate with the British. We still had some outstanding issues. Some of the provisions of the Treaty of Paris weren't being abided by by the British. Mm -hmm. And so the Jay Treaty was the attempt to just secure at least, at least move it a little further down the line to start to solve some of the issues. The problem was when the treaty came back and even Washington, when he read the treaty initially, he was like, what? What does this really do? And you know, again, at this time, the, the factions are really starting to form. And so Jay, as a Federalist, was attacked by the Democratic-Republican faction. Mm -hmm. They look at this tree and they're like, oh, well, this just gives Britain whatever they want. And what did we really get from this? And, you know, this was a waste of time and money. And, you know, what, what does this do except cozy up to Britain? It just baffles my mind that they did not realize the United States was not in control of these negotiations. Like they are not at a position of power during these. The U.S. is just establishing itself. But yet these men and their pride believe that they can still fight the British army when really they just won on a fluke in the revolution. Exactly. And and that's the thing. And that's the argument that John Jay made. He's like, I, I got what I could. No, we're not going to get everything, but this at least stays off. You know, we're not going into an immediate conflict with Britain. This gets us a little further along the line, and then we can come back and negotiate again. We can try to address other issues, but this at least right. opens up a door. And Clarefield notes that, quote, Pickering was among those who supported immediate and unqualified ratification of the Jay Treaty. There can be no doubt that his firm commitment was in large measure a product of his own New England commercial mentality. However, Pickering's support for the treaty, if partially based upon reasoned economic considerations, was heightened by an emotional reaction to the shrill, democratically oriented opposition to it. And so at this time, the Federalist faction in particular looked at the Democratic Republicans who were more trying to appeal to quote unquote the common man and you know that that was a very limited scope of you know who classified as the common man but the federalists looked at this appeal as just appealing to a mm -hmm. rabble you know you 
what you want these uneducated coups to have control over our government, to have a say so in, in our national affairs and our policies. Are you kidding me? We're the ones who are educated and we're from the upper echelons and we know what's going on. We can speak to foreign affairs. We can speak to domestic policy. And Pickering was one of these. You know, he he was very much of this, I won't say aristocratic, but at least some, you know, stratified um, and, and and we see this, you know, we saw this, this came out of the Revolutionary War, him feeling that he was a bit higher and a bit better than other people. Right. That's really interesting for a play for a new country who is going with this democracy and this exactly. new experiment. And so Pickering came to the cabinet at a time of heightened partisanism in the nation, and he would not be a voice of moderation. Rather, he would represent a very staunch Federalist point of view in the cabinet. And this will, of Mm -hmm. course, cause problems. (laughs) Foreshadowing. Pickering would find allies in the cabinet in pushing for the ratification of the Jay Treaty in Secretary of the Treasury Oliver Walcott Jr. and Attorney General William Bradford. However, there was still one voice of moderation on the cabinet. Secretary of State Edmund Randolph of Virginia. And for those who have listened to Randolph's episode, you may recall that Randolph kind of provided that relation to Washington. You know, as a fellow Virginian, they could see eye to eye. And Randolph was not, you know, he leaned more towards the Democratic Republican point of view, but he was really somewhere towards the middle. He could kind of see both sides. He played that role of just helping to tone down the rhetoric a bit. But not finding consensus in his cabinet, Washington couldn't figure out which way he should turn. And ultimately, Washington would have to decide whether to sign the treaty or not. And so the summer of 1795, he is just, he's still on the fence. He doesn't really know what he thinks about this treaty and his cabinet isn't giving him a clear path forward. So then we get to something else that we covered in the Randolph episode, the Fauché dispatches. And so just to do a quick summary here, the French minister to the U.S., Jean-Antoine Joseph Fauché, sent reports back to his government outlining how Randolph had been rather familiar and indiscreet in his relations with the minister. He was just a little too casual with him, telling him a bit more than he should have, not being that, you know, not holding back in his feelings of what was going on, and in particular about the Whiskey Rebellion and the Democratic Republican societies and all of that. These reports fell into British hands. And the British then promptly turned him over to Walcott, who then worked with Pickering, and they went to Washington, you know, and they showed Washington these dispatches, and they kind of helped Washington to understand what these dispatches meant, and maybe this Randolph guy who's opposing the Jay Treaty is not somebody who you should trust, because it seems like he's a little too familiar with the French, Seems like he has an agenda there. And so with this scandal, Randolph would resign and Washington would immediately sign the Jay Treaty. But there was a problem here. Now Washington had another vacancy in the cabinet. So he knew that he needed somebody at least temporarily. And given that Walcott was busy with the Treasury, which was the largest department at the time, And Bradford was, well, Bradford was dead at this point, so he couldn't (laughs) help out. (laughs) Another vacancy, of course. Pickering was the one that Washington turned to to serve as acting Secretary of State starting on August 20th, 1795. And and he went ahead and made sure, okay, this is an acting role. I'm going to find somebody permanent, and then you can keep on being Secretary of War. However... Finding somebody to serve as Secretary of State turned out to be much more complicated than Washington (laughs) could have imagined. He first approached William Patterson of New Jersey, 
who refused. Then Thomas Johnson of Maryland, who also refused. Then Charles Coatsworth Pinckney of South Carolina. He said no. Then he turned to Patrick Henry, who refused. Washington even made inquiries about Rufus King of New York, but Hamilton informed Washington that no King too had refused. Is this entire time is Pinkering still in the background, like raising his hand, like, ooh, pick me. And Washington's like, anyone? Anyone want this job? And Pinkering, ooh, pick me. Please pick me. Washington, anyone at all? Anyone? I don't see anyone. Who can do this? Anybody. Anybody. Was that just a common thing for people to just refuse? They just didn't want to do it back in the day or what? Now I feel like everyone's like, I'll do it. Ah! Exactly. Well, and, and, you know, there were a couple of things that went into this, you know, first of all, because it was so partisan and folks just didn't want to get into the middle of that mess. But then also with cabinet members of the time, you know, even though they were paid sizable salaries for the time, they were also expected to mm-hmm. have all these social events. They were expected to, you know, schmooze and, and hobnob and all of this. And so it got very expensive very quickly. And especially if folks tried to bring their families with them, it was just for many folks, it was more of a hassle than it was worth. And this would be a tough job to do at this point. Right? Yes. Like this. Secretary of State, you're basically walking into a buzzsaw. You have France breathing down your neck. You're battling with Britain. Like this is not a, a an easy job to do as a country that's establishing itself. Like I don't blame anyone for not taking it. Exactly, exactly. Because you know you've got the U.S. that that to your point from earlier is still this small minor power. And trying to navigate between Britain and France, these huge looming empires or or nations. And it was difficult. It, It, you know, they didn't want to go to war with either one because then that meant that first of all, we'd have to actually get a real army, not just, you know, five guys out in the Northwest (laughs) territory We'd have to get a Navy. We'd have to do all of this to to really build up our defenses. But then also merchants would suffer. You know, commerce would suffer. And there was no guarantees that whatever nation we ended up going to war with wouldn't just take over part, if right. not all, of the U.S. Use it as an excuse to claim a new colony. Right. It's just incredible that they still, even they knew this at the time, but they still want war. It's unbelievable exactly. to me. Exactly. Exactly. So the position of Secretary of State was definitely not, it wasn't just, you know, no. kick your feet up and relax. It was a difficult position. And, and we'll actually talk a little bit more about just how difficult it was in a, in a second. But so we have all these people, Washington's gone through his entire list. Everybody's refusing. And so finally, finally, he's like, okay, enough pickering you're already there would you be the secretary of state pickering actually refuses oh you son I, knew it. Of I was going to say he's going to refuse isn't he <laughs> are you kidding and and you do have to you know he's been around and he's seen washington ask like 50 other people before he finally asked him I mean, a little <laughs> hurt <Yeah. laughs> I would also be thinking, you know, hey, these these guys are saying no. What am I not seeing here? Uh, maybe I shouldn't do this. I just like the idea of Pickering like, no, you can pick someone else now. No. <laughs> exactly. Clearfield asserted that, quote, the New Englander considered himself not only too inexperienced, but also temperamentally unfit for a diplomatic career. Oh, that's a red flag. However with more persuasion from Washington, who at this point was just tired. He was ready to take down the help wanted sign. Anyone take it. He finally convinced Pickering to accept the appointment. And so Pickering became the permanent Secretary of State on December 10th, 1795. Now, beyond just the diplomatic 
role that the Secretary of State played at the time, there were some more complications in that. And, you know, you look at, at Pickering's position as Secretary mm. of War, and and yeah, he, he did have some complicated roles. You know, it, it, he was responsible not only for the Army, but for the building of the first six frigates of the U.S. Navy. Is but, he still Secretary of War? Or is that given up? So, so he did resign and pass that on. Okay. So he, he didn't hold them concurrently. Although we do have um, James Monroe coming up uh, a little later in the series who held the positions of Secretary of State and Secretary of War at the same time, which quite interesting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he had some work with the War Department, but the State Department is just a beast. Mm-hmm. In addition to managing foreign affairs and managing communications with the nation's diplomats abroad, the State Department, which was a staff of five people. Right. That's a real small staff for that amount of work. Yeah. Five people were responsible for the taking of the census, granting patents and copyrights, supervising the U.S. Mint, recording land patents, granting ship passports, and managing communications with federal marshals and district attorneys as there was no Justice Department and there wouldn't be Hmm. until Grant's presidency. So when does the State Department start forming its present-day responsibilities? Like, when does it get rid of the census and all of those type of things? So as they start expanding and creating new departments, some of those responsibilities get shifted there are still, you know, some administrative roles in the State Department, but, you know, it really did start to transition, especially as we developed increasing foreign relations. You know, at this time, it was really, it was more about Britain, France, Spain. Um, there were some other consulates in other areas, But it wasn't quite as extensive as it would become. And especially, you know, you get past the War of 1812, we start to establish more ministers and new nations. We have new nations forming in Latin America. And so as that starts to increase, then you see new departments being created, new offices being created, and some of these responsibilities shifting out. But yeah, at this time, it it really was the dumping ground for the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. Yeah, the State Department will do that. (laughs) Right. And so Clearfield notes that Pickering, quote, never fully appreciated the importance of delegating authority or responsibility. Always uneasy when allowing subordinates to handle even routine affairs, he kept far too many details in his hands. The result was that he often paid too much attention to routine matters that could have been handled by one or another of his aides. And especially in the time, you know, and and so he was handing off the War Department, but until James McHenry was in place, you know, when he was acting as Secretary of State, when he was still Secretary of War, this was a problem. You know, you've got this micromanager who's trying to manage these two, you know, the State Department itself is a ton of responsibility, but also the war department, it was a problem. It was a problem. But finally he was able to hand over the war department, James McHenry. He was able to focus on his new role at state. And so in the aftermath of the Jay treaty and all the, the Randolph scandal, Pickering was able to guide the Jay treaty through. But again, like I said, the, you know, there was still this animosity around the Jay treaty And not just domestically, but France looked at the Jay Treaty and they're like, okay, well, you're giving these special rights to Britain that we don't have. Um, Guys, we helped you win your independence. Right. (laughs) And you're going with the folks who you were fighting against and treating, giving them this first class treatment. What is going on here? (laughs) And so they began to agitate, and you see the French starting to involve themselves in American politics. The new French minister to the U.S., Pierre Auguste Adet, printed letters in American newspapers that were intended to influence the results of the 1796 U.S. presidential election. Well, I'm glad we never dealt with that again. 
I know, right? I mean, just a one and done deal here. <laughs> he says. <laughs> well, and and it really helped that pretty much nobody knew how the electoral college worked at the time because it had always been up until that point. Well, just George Washington's going to be president, right? Right. <laughs> we don't actually have to know how the system works. When George Washington's not running, they're like, oh crap, let's pull out the manual. <laughs> how does this work again? <laughs> And so when the French minister published his um, articles, I think one came out, there was still like one state that had to turn in their ballots, their electors had to turn in their ballots, but the others came out after the election was pretty much decided. So Mm -hmm. the timing wasn't right, but thankfully, (laughs) (laughs) but Pickering because of this and because of this animosity that was growing between the French and the U S he kept up a quote, sporadic and frigid conversation with the dead in the last year or so of the Washington presidency. And the problem with Pickering as secretary of state was not just that he didn't really have good diplomatic skills. Hmm. He also withheld information from President Washington about his communications with the French minister. Oh, that's great. That's not good. (laughs) No. I'm really starting to question, like, Washington gives a lot of credit on on his picks for Secretary of State, but I'm really starting to question, because he has a lot of people that stab him in the back. Uh, when you go Washington, when you go with, uh, not Hamilton, but Jefferson and now Pickering, like, what I really started to question his picks. And especially towards the end of his presidency, when he was so desperate to just find somebody to fill an office, anybody, just let Pickering do it. I don't care. <laughs> right. So Pickering would be responsible for drafting instructions for Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, who we've mentioned a couple of times as being in that list of folks that declined appointments. Well, he finally accepted one as U.S. Minister to France. And so Pickering was responsible for drafting his instructions to replace James Monroe. Again, from Clearfield, in Pinckney's instructions, quote, diplomacy was reduced to a rigid defense of previous American actions. Pinckney was given no powers to negotiate. So basically, we're sending a new minister to France who just is kind of a puppet and can't actually negotiate at all. That's a problem. That's insane. Like, just send someone over there. Hey, can you do this? Uh, I'll have to check. What about this? Uh, Let me get back to you on that one. I mean, it's not like you can just call him up on a phone, too. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Let me read from from this this script that I have here. <laughs> this is all I can tell you. <laughs> and another problem with this was that Monroe's recall, which Pickering not only supported but had openly advocated for, you know, James Monroe was more of the Jeffersonian side of things. And so Pickering, the staunch Federalist, didn't want a Jeffersonian over there representing the U.S., So Monroe's recall precipitated a crisis with the French government, as well as further fueling the flames of partisanism back at home. The French government had seen Monroe as an ally, and they were increasingly wary of the Federalist. And so when Monroe, their friend, is recalled, and then Pinckney is sent with this rigid set of instructions, the French government is like, you know what? forget this. Mm. We're not recognizing you. Oh, And so they refuse to deal with Pinckney. And meanwhile, you have Monroe who is now bitter because he's been recalled and is basically treated like a pariah by the Mm -hmm. administration. So he returns and becomes increasingly vocal on the democratic Republican side Mm -hmm. of things. And he's defending his record as a diplomat and in turn, going ahead and bashing the Washington administration, the Federalist, the cabinet, that guy Pickering. He, it just, it really starts to ramp up the partisanism. Now, this was at the end of Washington's presidency. You know, George Washington had served for two terms. 
folks wanted him to serve for a third. And he was like, no, 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 no. I'm so tired. Please just let me go home. Please. I'm so tired. I'm counting down the hours, the minutes, the seconds that I can turn in the keys and go home. And so with this, John Adams, of course, became the second president. He assumed office on March 4th, 1797. Now, one of the big criticisms of Adams as president is actually one of the first decisions that he made as president. He decided to keep Washington's cabinet. And Mm -hmm. this was both out of deference to Washington, you know, who's going to say that Washington picked bad people. Right. As well as the difficulty that Washington had faced in securing new cabinet members. I was like, I don't want to go through that. No. We'll just keep the guys that are there. And to be fair to Adams, this was the first transition of power from one president to the other. There was no precedent for crafting your own cabinet. No, and and to be fair to Adams, it's not like this project is going well outside of Washington. Washington really held everything together and people were at ease with that. And if Adams were to keep his cabinet as Washington, that Washington established, at least exactly. it kind of feels you, you easily. This, exactly. You know, you, you have this sense of continuity. You have this sense of continuation of power. And again, there was no precedent for this, but it, it right. did provide some of that comfort and especially to federalists you know this is an entirely federalist cabinet so we've got trusted folks in there we're all good however as noted by clearfield especially with secretary of state pickering quote pickering's pride and strong sense of individualism was bound to bring him into conflict with adams the new president after all was at least as proud and as independent as his secretary of state Pickering's essentially unbalanced approach to diplomacy, his trust of the English in particular, ran directly counter to Adams' more realistic view of the nature of international relations. And so it's just, it's a powder keg waiting to explode. Especially since Pickering was also a regular correspondent with someone who Adams saw as an enemy, the former Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton had actually... He had manipulated things behind the scenes. He had let folks know he wasn't really in favor of John Adams. Mm. He's better than Jefferson, I guess, but he just was not a fan of Adams. And the feeling was very much mutual. (laughs) But Adams comes into office and is immediately hit with this crisis with the French. So at this point, you know, they have refused the new U S minister to France. President Adams has to come up with something. What do we do? He decides on sending a three man peace commission to France to help to resolve some of the issues. And so having a three person commission gives him an opportunity to start to try and bridge the gap in the the factions, in the parties that have developed. And so Adams decides, you know, Pinckney's already there, so we'll name him to the commission. He's supposed to be the minister anyway. Elbridge Gary is also a person that Adams had had close relations with. He was from Massachusetts. He knew him. He could work with him. The third person, he decided, either needed to be the new vice president, Thomas Jefferson, are Jefferson's close associate, James Madison. And so Jefferson was in Philadelphia at the time, and so they Adams and Jefferson talked about it. And Jefferson was like, well, I'm not going. You know, I'm vice president. If something happens to you, I need to be here. I'll go ahead and ask Madison about it. I doubt that he'll accept, but, you know, I'll, I'll run it by him. And so, okay, fine. Jefferson goes. Adams meets with his cabinet. And he hadn't told them about this three-person commission that he had in mind before Mm -hmm. he talked to Jefferson. Oh. And so as soon as he shares with them his plans for this commission, and in particular that he was asking James Madison to go on the commission, they're not too (laughs) happy about this idea. 
I bet not. And they threatened to resign if Madison was appointed. Now, thankfully for Adams, Madison did, in fact, decline the offer. And so Adams was able to say, okay, I'll appoint somebody else. But in the first days of his presidency, he has this run-in with his own cabinet. It's going to be a long four years. (laughs) Yeah, it is. So do you do you think Adams isn't known for his uh, tactfulness, but do you think he secretly wanted them all to resign and that's what he was playing at? At that point, probably not just because, you know, he had just been president for like five minutes and uh, <laughs> here his cabinet resides. <laughs> it's not a good start. <laughs> now, a year or two down the line, I think he would have been more than happy for all of them to resign. Right. <laughs> but at this point, it was like, eh, we'll keep these guys a little longer. But it does, you know, you, you have to imagine that immediately he's starting to think, well, how much can I really trust these folks? You know, they're threatening to resign over a decision that is mine to make. Right. And so there's going to be turmoil. And in particular, Pickering. Pickering had opposed the entire idea of a commission. He said, you know, screw it. Let's go to war. Let, <laughs> oh. Let's go ahead and go to war with France. <laughs> right at the leap. <laughs> They're not talking to me. Let's go to war. <laughs> let's just go to war. Adams was a bit more balanced and he was like, uh, you know, he wanted to pursue diplomacy. He was a realist. We don't have really an army that can fight We don't really have a Navy that can actually fight France. No. We may need a few more things in place before we can go to war. So let's try the diplomatic approach. And so Adams actually finds an ally in Hamilton. Hamilton, likewise, realist, even though Hamilton was a little more pro-military than John Adams, He still, he was like, this just, this isn't the time. We need more negotiations. And so the commission was sent. And so this commission was Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, Elbridge Gary, and John Marshall. They went to France. They went to Paris to negotiate. But this first commission would actually result in the XYZ affair because Mm -hmm. agents of the French foreign minister Talleyrand, as was standard at the time, you know, this was, this was usual. They requested a little payment. Well, Hmm. you know, my hand is a little light. You can put some coins in it. If we're, if we're to talk, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not feeling it without something right (laughs) here in my hand. But the Americans, of course, were aghast. They're like, what, what is this? They're, they're not used to this. And, And so they naturally refuse. They're like, we're not paying you a bribe just to start negotiations. We are official representatives of our government. Do you want to talk to us or not? And right. And this is the French diplomat doing this on his own. This is not a direct order from the French government, correct? Like, this isn't something he was told to do. So, yes. And and that's the thing. Like, you know, Talleyrand and, and his folks, it was expected. And so they would kind of divvy up, you know, okay, well, we got this much from these diplomats. You take this part. You take this part. And so they enriched themselves in that. It wasn't going to the government. It was going to them personally. But that was seen as the cost of doing business. Mm. But... American diplomats had a different idea. And so the Peace Commission fails. They start to return back to the U.S. And meanwhile, you know, they're sending word to the government of this. And Adams is worried about it getting public. You know, even though he's not too happy with France over this, he he thinks that things should be approached differently. He still he's trying to avoid war and he knows if this gets public, if people hear that our diplomats were asked to give a bribe, they're going to be infuriated. But you've got the Democratic Republicans who, because this correspondence is secret, even from them, they're like, well, you know, why aren't things working out with the French? Why don't we have a deal yet? What's going on? And so they start pushing and 
in particular, Congress starts demanding, we need to see this correspondence. We need it to be released. And they keep pushing and Adams is sitting there like, you really don't want this to go public. You really don't want this to go public. Trust me. And they keep pushing. And so finally, Adam says, you know what? Here you go. Hmm. And so he releases the correspondence. It goes public. And naturally, everybody is infuriated. The general right. mood of the public shifts against the French and against the pro-French Democratic Republicans. And so you have this going on. But there's also some issues with Spain. And Pickering is involved with this as well. So Spain had allied with France against Great Britain. And at this point, Spain still controlled the Louisiana colony, which was basically on the western border of what was then the U.S. And there was concern now at this point in history that Spain would cede the colony to the French and that the French may try to retake land in what is now Canada. And so we're at this point of agitation with the French. And instead of being surrounded by Spain and Britain, there's the potential that we may be surrounded by France. Hmm. And that's a problem, you know, and especially if things go to war. So while Pickering directed diplomatic representatives in various European capitals to work to avoid a Spanish cession of territory to France, he also faced his own work back in the capital in pushing the Spanish minister to the U.S. Erujo to agree to a full implementation of the Treaty of San Lorenzo, which had been negotiated during the Washington presidency. And basically, this treaty had worked to settle the southern border between the U.S. and what's now the Gulf Coast, uh, Florida, and the Mississippi and Alabama Gulf Coast. And the reason that this needed to be settled and quickly was that settlers were already moving into lands that had been disputed. What? Americans don't move on to land illegally? I know. It never happens. Never happens. Never once. (laughs) Exactly. And so this was a problem. You know, if the Spanish didn't go ahead and evacuate that area, you've got these American settlers coming in. And they're not always known for being the most um, cautious, the most cautious. Exactly. And so this could potentially lead to war. And so Pickering pushes Arujo and he's like, no, you agreed in this treaty. Go ahead and implement it. It needs to be done. And this is one instance in his tenure as Secretary of State that Pickering's firm and immovable stance did pay off because in 1798, the Spanish did agree to put the treaty into effect. It established the southern border. Spanish forces evacuated the disputed area, the previously disputed area. And so things were able to proceed without conflict. But 1798... With the XYZ affair, with the failure of the Peace Commission, it was just looking like war with France was inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so President Adams worked to kind of limit the scope of this undeclared war. You know, he he realized that there were going to be conflicts, and especially on the high seas. If there was, you know, some conflict, it was probably going to be there. But He worked to limit the scope to focus just on protecting the neutral rights of the nation. You know, it wasn't necessarily that that we were in conflict with France. We were just Mm -hmm. defending our rights. Right. Pickering and other arch federalists, on the other hand, pushed for preparations for total war. They just wanted war. Of course. The British, meanwhile, supported the arch federalist efforts naturally because they were still at war with France. And so if the U S entered into war with France, that gives them another ally. Mm. And so at this point, the British become a bit more conciliatory. Oh yeah. You know, well, well, how can we, how can we help you America? You know, let's, we'll, we'll send you like a, 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 we'll send you a fruit basket. Will that make things better? You know, what, what can we do for you? Right. Wouldn't it just be terrible if the Americans and the French just happened to get into a fight where we can just pick up a little bit? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well played. Well played, Britain. Oh, yes. And so this point, this early to mid 
point in 1798 would actually prove to be the high watermark for the Federalists. After this point, the mood, the public mood starts to sour on the Federalists, due in no small part to the Alien and Sedition Acts. And Pickering, as you can imagine, was completely in support of these acts, which, and for those who don't know the Alien and Sedition Acts, so this was really aimed at in particular, like French immigrants coming Mm -hmm. to the U S and there were quite a few at the time, you know, folks who had come over after Louis the 16th had been deposed. And then with all the shifts in the revolutionary governments, uh, as one faction went out of power, they would have folks that would come to the U S. And so there were a great amount of French folks in the U S. And so the alien act, was supposed to give the government increased powers to be able to deport folks. It lengthened the amount of time that folks would have to be in the U.S. before they could be citizens. The mm-hmm. Sedition Act, just as it as the name suggests, it's all about you know punishing those who spoke against the government. And so Pickering was like, this is wonderful. Let's do this. I want to enforce these acts as expansively as possible. What I don't understand is I know like the Supreme Court is new and it hasn't had time to really get rulings. But how did they ever think this was constitutional? Like this goes against what the country was founded on. And it was in particular, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, quite a few of the democratic Republicans were like, exactly what you said. This is unconstitutional. Are you kidding me? And even Mm -hmm. John Adams had his own qualms about it. You know, he would allow some limited enforcement of the sedition act, but he blocked he he didn't want it to get out of hand. And, and in particular, like with the Alien Acts, he, he was a bit more hesitant about using that authority. And so here you've got, again, Adams versus Pickering. Pickering's ready to go. Let's, let's deport those French. <laughs> and President Adams is like, uh, just, just hold on a little bit. Slow your roll. Let's, let's, not, let's not do that right now. Right. We're not even at war with them yet. Do you not realize that? (laughs) The opinions just are so extreme. Like the pendulum swings are so extreme in this time period. Not that they get much better. It's 90 or nothing. Right. And so increasingly Adams and Pickering are at odds. And Mm -hmm. this is exacerbated when Congress authorizes a new army. And this new army starts to come together. And so, of course, you know, you've got a new army. You're facing the prospect of war. Who do you want as commander in chief? George Washington. George Washington. Yep. (laughs) So George Washington is named as commander in chief. And Congress creates three generalships under Washington. The problem was Washington wanted Alexander Hamilton as his second in command. Because he can trust Hamilton. Hamilton, however, in terms of the order of rank from, you know, the Continental Army on down, Hamilton is ranked fourth. And second is Henry Knox. But Mm -hmm. because Washington and Knox had had their falling out, Washington was insistent, um, no, uh, Knox is not going to be my second in command. I need somebody I can trust. I need Hamilton. And so Washington and Adams are at odds over this. Mm -hmm. Pickering, meanwhile, goes behind Adams's back and writes to Washington, urging him to oppose Adams and his push for Knox to be named as second in command. He's like, you know, General Washington, you should have the authority to name whoever you want as your second in command. You push back on this president. Ultimately, Adams would back down because who questions George Washington? Right. It's a it's a good political game, but boy, does it seem like Adams should have pushed for those resignations right away, doesn't it? Unbelievable. And it works to Pickering's political advantage. Pickering can say, oh, Hamilton, you remember I went to bat for you. I even challenged the president who you don't like. 
you know, it, and it really was a very political move. It was also, you know, just increasingly this, this animosity, you know, if Adam says it, I'm going to do something against it. Right. And this was just such unnecessary drama at a time that why was this new army coming together? Oh, right. The French, we may be going to war. Right. And meanwhile, we've got this jockeying for power and all this drama. And Pickering's, of course, right in the middle of it. So the fall of 1798, Adam starts to play around with this idea. And and again, like Adams was not really gung-ho on the whole idea of war to begin with. And so he starts to think about a new peace commission to go to France. And naturally, Pickering, the chief diplomat of the U.S., is against diplomacy. He takes this uh, uh, opportunity to attack anybody who's saying, oh, well, we need a new peace commission. He's like, no, we just need to go to war. It's time. It's time. We need to just deal with France. And Pickering doesn't make much headway. And in particular, the French foreign minister Talleyrand at this point you know, Talleyrand and his agents were chiefly responsible for the breakdown of the first round of negotiations. But by this point, Talleyrand is like, you know what? We're not in a great place right now. Maybe let's just go ahead and make peace with the U.S. Let's go ahead and just settle this one at least so we can focus our efforts elsewhere. And so he starts making overtures to U.S. diplomats in Europe about the possibility of a new round of diplomacy. Because this is reign of terror time in the French Revolution, isn't it? Like that's why this is actually this is actually a little later. So this is under the Directory government, okay. and so they had the reign of terror. The Directory co- government came in, but it was very corrupt and very weak. But the French are starting to see some successes in the military due to this guy. You may have heard of him, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> I thought it was dynamite. I thought it was Napoleon dynamite. Is that not <laughs> my thinking of someone else? That, that's the other guy, the other Napoleon. <laughs> to be fair to Pickering, didn't he say he wasn't a good diplomat? Exactly. I mean, so I feel like they should have seen this coming. Like he turned it, what he turned down because he said what he doesn't have the mentality or whatever. And then now he's like, war, war, let's go to war. (laughs) I told you I'm not a good diplomat. Let's just do the war thing. I don't know what to do. I don't know. (laughs) And and so again, you know, you see this this breakdown of the relationship between the president and the secretary of state as 1799 comes around because Adams sends to the Senate the nomination of William Vans Murray as the new U.S. Minister to France without consulting his cabinet. So Adams is just acting very independently. And so Pickering, also independent, but he's like, well, I should be consulted. I, I'm the Secretary of State. And isn't this the second time Adams has done this? Like the first round, he didn't tell them. You don't, he didn't learn from that at all? No. And so Federalist leaders are just like, okay, what is this guy doing? And so they finally are able to convince Adams to withdraw that nomination and replace it with a new three-man commission. And so this is composed of Murray, Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, and William R. Davey of North Carolina. And though the nominations went through, you know, everybody finally said, okay, let's just give Adams his second commission. Pickering is still not happy. And so he, as the person who was supposed to draft their official instructions, which they couldn't leave without those instructions, Pickering keeps on finding reasons to push off that work. And it doesn't help that Adams was back in Quincy, Massachusetts, and Pickering was still in Philadelphia. And Chill, of course, there's another yellow fever outbreak in Pickering and the cabinet move the government to Trenton, New Jersey, to be able to just have a a temporary base of operations. But that distance and the delay in communication works in Pickering's favor because, you know, every time that Adams is writing to Pickering, 
asking about these instructions, Pickering's able to say, you know, when he finally gets around to responding, oh, I just got your letter. It hasn't been sitting on my desk for the last two weeks. (laughs) I just got it. I promise. Um, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And his hope was that if he delayed this long enough, there was going to be war. Something was going to happen. We were going to end up in war war with France. This bloody commission wasn't going to go anywhere. And Pickering would finally have his war. President Adams, on the other hand, finally has enough. He's tired of playing this cat and mouse game. And so he packs up. He goes to Trenton, New Jersey. He shows up. He doesn't really give him much warning that he's coming. And he shows up and he's like, okay, where are these instructions? And oh, by the way, I've got a few other things to talk to all of you guys about right now. I'm tired of the way things are going. I'm the president. You're going to listen to me. And so finally, Pickering drafts the instructions and the commission set sail on November 1st. For months after this, Adams and his cabinet linger in this kind of cold war. Adams didn't want to dismiss any of the department heads. He wanted them gone, but he didn't want to have to be the one to actually fire them. They were determined, you know what? We're in office. We've been in office longer than you. So we're not resigning. We're not going anywhere. Deal with it. Finally, though, Adams forces a confrontation in the second week of May, 1800. And on May 10th, Adams sends Pickering a short note, which asks for his resignation. Pickering being Pickering, he, of course, refused. And he asserted, you know what? I'm going to stay in office until the end of your term. You're going to have to sit there with me. (laughs) We're going to have to look at one another until (laughs) both of us are out of here. (laughs) Just a big staring contest for the next two years. Exactly. Two days later, President Adams has had enough. And so he sends Pickering a very curt note telling him that he is dismissed from service. That that's a pretty big like because that's the first like presidential removal, isn't it? Like that's a precedent in terms of the cabinet. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here he gets this note. You're fired. Pickering does not respond. Instead, he just works in his office at the State Department through the end of the day. And when he leaves from home that evening, that is the end of his tenure in the cabinet. So basically, you know, he gets this note that he's fired and he's going to do this one more. I'll leave whenever I'm damn well ready. <laughs> I was wondering what the motivation is that like I'm a I'm a proper patriot and I'm going to finish out because that's my duty or like, I'll be whenever I want to. (laughs) And with Pickering, you, you get that it's, it's pretty much the latter. I'll leave when I want to. You can't tell me when to leave. I would love to know what he accomplished that afternoon. It says here (laughs) what actually got accomplished. (laughs) You, You can just see him kind of writing on this piece of paper. I hate John Adams. I hate John Adams. I hate John Adams. (laughs) It's just like carved inside the... (laughs) Yeah, he like carves it under the desk. Carves it under the desk for the next guy. (laughs) Exactly. Somebody knocks on the door. I have your copy, sir. Oh, great. That's perfect. Oh, what's on your desk? (laughs) Oh, dear. Anything that he can do to, you know, (laughs) really mess things up. (laughs) But he does finally leave, and so he is out of the cabinet. And he would remain out of public service for a while after his departure from the administration. But he still kept up his ties with the arch-federalist leaders. So they were writing letters back and forth. Can you believe what Adams is doing? Oh, this is such a screw-up. Oh, crap. Now we've got Jefferson as president. Really didn't like Adams, but at least he wasn't Jefferson. And so he's keeping up this correspondence. And in 1802, Pickering and his family finally returned to Massachusetts. And Pickering starts to agitate for the states in New England to secede from the Union. At this point, this is a couple of years into Jefferson's presidency. And 
Federalists in New England are just like, this is ridiculous. We are losing left and right. Our country is being destroyed by this guy, Jefferson. You know what? The Southerners want to run things. Let them run their own country. We'll run our own. Which is interesting because a man from Massachusetts was just running the country. And now a Virginian takes over. And now it's suddenly Southern tyranny. Exactly. And so Pickering finally is able to return to public service. He was named to the U.S. Senate in 1803 when Dwight Foster resigned from his seat. Surprise, surprise, Pickering would often find himself at odds with his fellow senator from Massachusetts, the son of the former president, John Quincy Adams. They were both Federalists, but Adams and Pickering, yet again, next generation of Adams, they're at odds. And Pickering was the voice of opposition throughout the Jefferson presidency, but he got himself particularly into hot water with his opposition to the Embargo Act. And so at this time, a special envoy, George Rose, had been sent by the British government. This was after the Chesapeake Leopard Affair and, you know, U.S.-British relations were really suffering over this issue of impressment. And so it wasn't really uncommon then, as it is now, you know, for members of Congress to interact with foreign diplomats. So, you know, everybody's in D.C., you're going to all the parties. Naturally, you're going to run into one another, have conversations. That's fine. Pickering, however, went well beyond the line of propriety when he attempted to convince Rose to urge British Foreign Secretary George Canning to continue to hold a hard line against the Jefferson administration in order to push the president to implement harsher measures in enforcing the Embargo Act, which would, in turn, hurt the Democratic Republicans politically in the U.S. So basically, he's trying to influence a foreign government for political gain. Not only is this an ethical issue, it's also a violation of the Logan Act, which was enacted in 1799, which forbade unauthorized American citizens from negotiating with foreign governments with whom the U.S. were in conflict. So it's not only an ethical issue, it's a legal issue. He is breaking the law. A short time later, Pickering got himself into even more trouble by reading classified documents in an open session of the Senate. (laughs) Did it have the word classified on the envelope? (laughs) Or did it? I, I, I think he just kind of crossed that out. Oh, no, no. I, I say it's not classified. Not classified. <laughs> exactly. Just add the not. It's okay. I was Secretary of State. I can, I can, I've got this authority, right? Well, the Senate did not think too kindly and did not think that he had the authority to decide what was classified and not. So the Senate voted 27 to censure Pickering on January 2nd, 1811. And he was ultimately not reelected to the Senate for another term. I guess the folks at home realized this probably isn't the guy that we need in the Senate representing us. And so he left his seat on March 3rd, 1811. This still, however, was not the end of Pickering's political career. <laughs> he just keeps going. <laughs> like whack-a-mole. Like, he's kicked out of the cabinet. Oh, he's a senator yeah. now. Bop. Right here, psych. Right here. No, over here. Have you seen my resume? No. Bop. <laughs> Have you seen my resume? I knew this guy named Washington. <laughs> John Adams. And so Pickering was first chosen as a member of the Massachusetts State Executive Council. And then he was elected to that other house in Congress, the House of Representatives, in 1812. And he assumed a seat at the next session of Congress. I would love to be that first day. Everyone's like, oh, he's gone now, finally. Oh, wait, he's using the other door now? Are you (laughs) freaking kidding me? Who let this guy back in? Oh, my gosh. Massachusetts, uh, we need to have a talk. (laughs) Have you heard anything about this guy? He is awful. Please stop sending him. No, he's your problem now. I was about to say, (laughs) they're throwing him out the door, too. (laughs) 
And yet he's oblivious to it. He just thinks, I'm great. I'm being elected. And he doesn't see everyone like locking their doors behind him. (laughs) And so Pickering, as a U.S. representative, continues to agitate for New England to secede from the Union during the War of 1812. Now, he wasn't a member of the Hartford Convention, but Pickering's work certainly contributed to the effort which in turn proved to be detrimental for the future of the Federalist cause because everybody looked at the Hartford Convention and this idea of secession as eh, just a little treasonous, and especially when we're still at war, um, didn't sit well. (laughs) Somehow he was, Pickering was named as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1815. (laughs) so <laughs> they decided for some reason to honor Pickering. <laughs> they were the last one like, yeah, he seems fine. What I don't know anything about him. He, he was a, a former secretary of state. How bad could he be? <laughs> yeah, no ego right. on this man. <laughs> so after serving two terms in the House, Pickering decided to not stand for re-election. He left the house in 1817 to return to his farm near Wyndham, Massachusetts. In 1820, he moved back to his childhood home of Salem. And once he was there, he tried one more time to win election to the U.S. House. But for once, the people of Massachusetts said no. They did not elect him to the house again. And so Pickering would live out the rest of his days as a farmer. And he passed away in Salem on January 29th, 1829. He was buried in the Broad Street Cemetery in Salem. Now, a couple of notable things about his legacy. So during his lifetime, Pickering was actually the namesake for Fort Pickering, which was a fortification built for coastal defense in Salem, Massachusetts. During World War II, a U.S. cargo ship, the SS Timothy Pickering, was named after him. Unfortunately, this ship was lost off the coast of Sicily in 1943. And finally, Pickering's family home in Salem, which dated back to around 1664, would ultimately be the home for 10 generations of the Pickering family. It's believed to be the oldest home in the U.S. continually occupied by one family. And so after 10 generations starting in 1664, This long lineage came to an end in 1998 when the Goodhue family moved into the Pickering house. Huh. Dang. So. Is there a price on that? Like, did they have to pay a, like, that had to be listed on the real estate, wasn't it? I just bought a house, so I'm learning all of these cool terms. But uh, they had to pay a premium to get the family out of the house, or? I know you would think. And especially, I mean, it's a house from 1664. It has this long connection to American history. You would think that would go for a good bit. (laughs) Unless there's zero foundation anymore. Like, it's just a (laughs) great He's missing a wall. That's what they didn't tell you. Please sign these papers right now before the wind starts blowing. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's still straw as the roof. I don't think that's the code. And with that, that is the end of the life and career of Timothy Pickering. Huh. I'm kind of expecting, um, because he keeps popping back up, does he zombify and just does he still pop up again? <laughs> Here's my training manual. You're, you're going to see in the midterm elections, the zombie Timothy Pickering is oh running for <laughs> the U.S. House. <laughs> They'll be like the statues inside uh, Congress would like, no, please. they suddenly come alive. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. And so this gets us to our scoring round. So our first round in terms of our scoring criteria and categories is the whole picture. This round looks at the overall career and character of the cabinet member. And there are 10 points maximum available for each ranker. And since there are two of you, basically we will take whatever your individual scores are and then divide it by two. And so that'll be your score. And then I will also give my points. So what are your thoughts on the overall career and character of Timothy Pickering? 
he perseveres through a lot. Persevere is a word, I guess. Uh, he's stubborn comes to mind. I guess he kind of has like an Alexander Hamilton light, like he's diet Alexander Hamilton. I I don't think I would particularly like the man, but when his pros and when he was with the cabinet, he had Spain enforce their treaty and kick France uh, kept France out of the territory. Other than, I mean, is there another positive? He was a diplomat who wanted to go to war the entire time. <laughs> he kind of stab. He doesn't stab at. He stab at him in the back by talking with Washington. Uh, I can't see him doing particularly well for me. I mean, he did keep. He did keep getting elected, though. Is the thing. So he had to have been like, at least you know. A people person, right? There had to be some charisma there. I don't yeah. know where it is. Maybe he was very good. I mean, he was pleasant to work with. Was he? <laughs> At least when you just had him in a room by himself, just you know, going into the the nitty gritty details of stuff, then he was pleasant to work with. Let's just stay in that room. Don't let's let's not have to deal with you. He was probably like really loud like so people could still hear him like he needed to he had to have okay I, I, for me it's just hard to believe that someone i, I always go back to that I, it's hard for me to for someone to just be like war 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 we're going to war so he had to had have some reason like that just and maybe uh he kept to himself or something that happened to him while he was over there for him to just take such a hard stance on nope it's only war i don't care he he was a veteran of the Revolutionary War, and it sounds like he didn't enjoy his experience. So why right. why is he a war hawk at the end of his life? But I'm also wondering if, you know, because that was really one of the successful points in his career. You know, he, he was successful in his roles in the Continental Army. And so you kind of wonder if maybe it's it's turning back to those glory days and you know, maybe Maybe this is what we need to do. This is what I'm good at. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe trying to chase like what was made, what made him so successful in the first place. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think. Hmm. I think um, if he was a movie, I do think he's more Forrest Gump. He's just angry Forrest Gump. He kind of backs <laughs> himself into everything. Right. He just randomly finds himself in all these crazy situations. Life is like a box of chocolates that I smash. <laughs> oh, can you imagine that poor lady at the bus stop having to listen to him? <laughs> you should give him a copy of his resume. Right? <laughs> He's already read his resume to her probably three <laughs> times. I think uh, the whole picture, I think I'm not, I'm going to say four it's entertaining. If it was a movie, it would be entertaining to watch. I just don't know if he would be the the good guy. I was gonna say I was gonna say a six because I think I mean because he kept getting elected and doing so much stuff. You know, I, I feel like he did have a good career. Whether I mean, but his character, you know, obviously he sounds kind of like not the greatest person to be in a room with. But everyone is different in work and home you know so he could have done he could have been a good person i mean i don't think he was a bad person but um i just think he wanted to be successful absolutely and i think i'm going to go middle of the road and give him a five just because you know to be fair he you know like you said matt he had this successful career you know he he held all these positions he did rise sometimes get reluctantly, you know, folks giving him appointments, but he still did have this, this lengthy career and he kept getting elected to these offices. And so there is something there and he did have some successes, you know, his, his time in the continental army, even though it was frustrating, even though it, it disillusioned him, you know, it, it was still these were key roles in the revolution. 
even as Secretary of State, you know, the success that he had with Spain and being able to get the treaty implemented and, and resolve things on the frontier, that at least was helpful. So I, I think that, you know, he's not a complete success, but he's, I, I'd say, middle of the road. But then that gets us to really focusing in on that time in the cabinet with the go-getter category. And so this round looks at the impact of the cabinet member during their time in the cabinet. And so again, just like um, with the last round, 10 points maximum for each of us. What do we think about his tenure as Secretary of War and Secretary of State? I mean, go-getter is a way to put, like, he went after things. He seemed like he was very goal-driven. Uh, but did he accomplish the things that he set out to do? You know, I mean, what, towards the end, he fought to, like, what, succeed, right? Try to get P- uh, the North. As a senator, yeah. <laughs> New England? Uh, even, like, so, he probably is known best for, what, the XYZ affair, which really wasn't his doing. He just happened to be there. I suppose as establishing American diplomacy, I guess you could establish that. He didn't back down from it. He didn't give in to it. That's some bone. That's some good, uh, good diplomacy. But then you just go to the secretary of state just wants to go to war because he just wants to go to war. But I mean, it's a, as a Secretary of War, he did oversee the first uh, ships being built. Um, that is interesting too. He was a Secretary of War. He knew how well the like the U.S. was militarily. Like he knew how big the army was, the navy was in existence, and yet he still wants to challenge a superpower of the of the time. That doesn't seem like it. Seems like pride is getting in his in his way more than thought, I guess. Mm-hmm. I think I might. Well, then he also writes against Adams, uh, against Knox, to watch, to butter himself up to Washington. So I, I still think I, I might just stick with another four again. It's not all terrible, but you can't sabotage your own president and be a 10, I guess. Yeah, I was going to go actually one lower and do a three. I just don't think he did. He did some stuff, but not a lot. Yeah. And likewise, I think. I think I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with a four. Just because in terms of kind of the day-to-day, and especially with the State Department being involved in so much, it does seem like in terms of the administrative aspects, he made sure that things were taken care of. He did have some successes. And he did, he certainly had an impact on the cabinet. I don't necessarily think that we, I don't think we can say it was positive, but he was certainly a force to be reckoned with in the cabinet. But with that, he didn't really achieve his goals. His goal was war with France, war with France. And he didn't get it. The president ultimately came out on top. Diplomacy came out on top. But so he's he's not necessarily successful in driving his agenda. He just acts in this spoiler role of making things twice as difficult as they have to be. And so this, with our scores entered in, we are currently at 24.5 points for, oh, actually, no, we are currently at 17.5 points for Pickering, and now we have an opportunity to take some of those away. In the hot seat round, this round discusses any disgraceful behavior of or actions committed by the cabinet member. 
And this disgrace does not have to be during their tenure of office in the cabinet. Although in Pickering's case, I think there are some things to discuss in this category that did happen during that tenure. And so each of us has the option of giving him negative points up to negative 10 points each. Uh, I guess I'm going to go first thing I'll point out is the negotiation with native Americans very early on. I don't know how much detail was in there, but just with the tone, I mean, it's not great that entire history, I guess. So um, I'm going to knock them off from that. Um, Fred Mitt wanting to push Massachusetts to secede from the Union. That's a big multiple one. times, multiple yeah, times. Yeah, not he just kept once. pushing it, just pushing it. Uh, as far as like, there's really not a lot of like personal disgrace for him. He seems for like you didn't hear any stories of him like being, I don't know, uh, like having an affair or. I don't think he like used his office for like personal fortune gain, just like it's more his ego, his driving, like his motivation because he wanted to be an important person. So there's that. I think that, that surprises me. I think it is kind of disgraceful though, that he was pushing so hard for war. Um, especially being a diplomat, you know, he could have, there could have been, I mean, obviously there was other options, right? Cause they went with those other options. So it, that he wouldn't even, that he wouldn't even hear like the argument on the other side. It was just like, Nope, this is what it is. Um, he didn't want the, he didn't want the, the three to come over again. You know, he's like, Nope, Nope, no, nah, there's it's just beyond that. It's beyond that. You know, Nope. La 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 la. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I I feel like that is disgraceful in and of itself because, I mean, war is, should be considered like a last, like there is literally no other solution. There's literally nothing we can do. We've talked, we've done meetings, we've tried this, we've tried that. And the fact that he wouldn't even consider it, I feel is it should be considered negatively on his career. I also just saw him, I know he he did back the Sedition Act, which isn't great. I know that wasn't necessarily his legislation and he didn't sign it, but I mean, you look at a big board of five worst legislative laws signed into the United States. That's normally up there is the Alien and Sedition Act. So it's a different kind of disgrace. I don't know. I'm going to take a few points off for the Native American negotiation. I'm going to take a few points off for wanting to secede and going behind Adams's back and the Sedition Act. So I'm going to take off. I'm going to take off hmm, five points. I was also thinking uh, about five points as well. Because I don't, again, I don't think... Obviously, he wasn't a bad person, right? But he just did a couple bad things, unfortunately, that, you know, you get tarnished. He seems very ego-driven. Yeah. Especially, I mean, look at it. When uh, he was asked to resign, I'm going to work my day of office. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like, that just tells you what kind of character he was. And then not even, like, he resigns, or well, he gets fired. But then he comes back as a senator, then he comes back as... Uh, you know, yeah. He just keeps coming back, and part of me thinks like, "Well, they can't fire me too many more times because right. they can keep coming back." Just walks in with the finger guns, you know. Hey, look at me! <laughs> da, 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 da. Does a little spin before he sits down. <laughs> you know, it's like, God, why do you keep showing up? Because I can. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talk to the people, right? Hey, 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 hey. hey. <laughs> And you really do get the sense of Pickering as just at points, just being a contrarian just because he can. And he is this constant disruptive force. And, uh, you know, I I agree with all the points that you brought up thus far. It, It just, there's so much there that, 
you know, you just, his impact was so negative and you don't really get a good sense of why, except that he just, he wanted to be that contrarian. And so I am going to agree with y'all. I'm going to go for five points as well, which then gets him down to 7.5 points. But we do have a few more categories where he can potentially pick up some points. First of all, his tenure of office. Now, with this category, and and this particularly comes into play with Pickering. So the tenure of office is the entire time that a cabinet member served in a full-time capacity. So Pickering did have that point where he was acting Secretary of State, but that doesn't count. He wasn't the permanent Secretary of State, so we'll only count the time that he was the full Secretary of State. Um, And so with that, and there wasn't really any overlap, like he did resign as Secretary of War when he assumed Secretary of State, so there's no overlap, because otherwise, if there is overlap, we count the tenures independently, but in this case, it's just kind of a continuous... um, Place. So he served as Secretary of War from January 2nd, 1795 to December 10th, 1795. And then he served as Secretary of State from December 10th, 1795 to May 12th, 1800. And so rounding this up, um, it gives him five points in this category. There are also the bonus points. So a cabinet member earns one bonus point for serving in more than one full-time cabinet position. So Pickering does get this one. Yeah. We also award a bonus point if the cabinet member served as a full-time cabinet member in more than one presidential administration. And so in this case, he served in the Washington and Adams administrations. He's actually the first cabinet member that we've had to date that actually gets this point in this bonus round. But he does not get a bonus point for becoming president because thankfully I think, I think we can all agree it is a good thing that Timothy Pickering was never anywhere close to becoming president. (laughs) Can you imagine that alternative timeline? (laughs) But we do have one more question. After all I've shared about Pickering's life and career and what we've discussed Do you think that this cabinet member is notable enough or impactful enough to earn a seat at the table of the cabinet all-stars? Oh, I feel like this is a borderline call. Um, I'm trying to think. I keep getting the feel like, again, he's Diet Alexander Hamilton. What am I not, what am I getting with Pickering that I'm not already getting with Alexander Hamilton or someone else? So is he really, does he have that legacy that allows him a seat at this table? And I don't know if I see it, so... I might go with a no, but I can be talked out of it. (laughs) See, I'm going to go with a hard no. I just don't think I imagine, you know, um, you know, a table full of greats. And I I just don't feel like he even makes the top. Like, no, it it, to me, I'm like, okay, no, why, why, why are you here? It's, it's that one where they'd all turn and be like, wrong room, buddy. Kids tables over that way. Why don't you go, you know, have a seat over there? You know, I just don't feel like even even the greats would say, "What? what why are you here? You did nothing." Do you think he'd be sliding his resume underneath that door, though? <laughs> <laughs> oh, most definitely. <laughs> you just hear a carving from under the table. You know, <laughs> so it's still mad, and. And I I think I agree with both of you. And it really comes down to, you know, yes, it's a fascinating life and career to study. 
not really for good reasons, but right. <laughs> because of all the the tension, the animosity, the the you know his his curmudgeonness. But at the end of the day, what did he really achieve? Right. He was an able administrator. And that's about it, you know, had a couple of, of successes here and there, but by and large, his career was just a great deal of drama. And unlike folks like Alexander Hamilton, who also had a great deal of drama, Hamilton also had successes. He had things that he could point to as this is my legacy and Pickering just doesn't. Right. So I I think that Pickering is going to be a no for this. And I think that is a very wise call. We will finally send Mr. Pickering on. Please do not try for any public offices ever again. Lock the door. (laughs) Wherever this table is, lock the door. (laughs) Well, Eric and Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining me and and for listening to this um, fascinating and 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 interesting lesser known character in the in presidential administrative history. I think that Pickering does offer us much that much perspective that we don't necessarily get, and it helps us to understand that you know we had this dirty politics. We had these um, folks who kind of blocked the way of progress and these personal vendettas and agendas, even at this early stage in American political history. Um, and and I think it's, it's important to note that because especially, you know, as time goes on and, and we get further into future administrations Pickering is more of an outlier at this point, but we're going to see some more of this moving forward. So thank you so much for joining me, for being able to explore this with our audience. And for the audience, please check out the Ranking 76 podcast. I will have information about the podcast um, on my social media. It'll be on the, the page for this episode on the website. And um, look forward to hearing all the characters that y'all are going to explore on your podcast and rank. Oh, they're fun. Um, a lot more uh, personal uh, dishonor, but they're fun to talk about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much again. And thanks to all of you for listening. And until next time, stay safe and healthy. Be kind to one another and take care, dear friends. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal.